Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to take the, the high picture of things today. Um, we, you know, we've been dealing with cybersecurity issues and vulnerabilities for about 30 years, maybe more. Uh, if we go back to 1988, we're almost coming up on the 30th year anniversary of the Morris Worm. And, um, you know, we see sort of the, the ransomware attack, the recent WannaCry attack, um, the Morris Worm is sort of the progenitor of that. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of old school attacks coming back, the macro attacks uh, that struck um, uh, the Ukraine power grid um, and um, ransomware itself, which dates circa around 2005 when it began. So we're looking at a lot of issues that we haven't really resolved. We've had um, some Band-Aid solutions um, and they have, those have bought us some time, but things like Heartbleed and the SS7 hijackings that are going on, uh, things like this are indicators that we've run out of time with the Band-Aids and we need to take a broader look at um, global solutions um, that get at the core infrastructure problems and as well as the, the larger issues in general, not just the tech issues. Um, so the, our two speakers today are going to address these issues. Um, first of all, we've got Jay Healy uh, to my right here is Senior Research Scholar at Columbia University School for International Public Affairs. Um, and Jay is going to talk about uh, a New York uh, task force that he was a part of that looked at these bigger issues and some of the so solutions that they've come up with. And after him will be um, Jan Neutzel, Director of Cybersecurity Policy at Microsoft for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And so our format here is going to be, uh, Jay will speak first for about 20 minutes, and then we'll do about 25 minutes of q and um, I'll ask some questions, but I want you guys to as well. Um, and then we'll go over to Jan for, he'll do a 20 minute presentation and then we'll again follow that with about 25 minutes of Q&A. Okay? Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so freaking tired, I don't even know how I'm standing. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks for, for joining. So I'm gonna talk about this uh, New York Cyber Task Force. Um, we are in the final, sta uh, final stages of the draft. Um, actually, I was, I was just working on that out, out at the tables, t uh, intaking caffeine. And um, so this is, the, this is the final draft before we're gonna come out with it um, in the next coming weeks. And it really fits in with a lot of what you already heard this morning, um, especially from uh, Paul Nicholas and, and Ralph Langner. Um, and so I'll be referencing back to some of their points. We hadn't coordinated this, it just kind of worked out this, that way um, that, our, that our thinking is going down the same path. Um, and really where we were coming from, this is, um, th this is my paraphrasing of, of the New York Cyber Task Force. I'm not sure they would uh, essentially uh, have signed off on this wording if they knew I were using it. Um, but that we have been behind as defenders for decades. Um, actually, since the 70s, I've, I've found quotes that have said, that the attackers will always get through. And so just like Ralph said in his talk earlier today, like we can do better at defense. We don't necessarily need a cyber Manhattan project or a cyber moonshot if we are just doing some things better and we're doing it according to the right strategy, we can make significant, significant gains. And so what we're gonna come through is, is my message is, is that there's been no central strategy between in, uh, behind information security for the past decades. And you need that strategy or that, or that policy framework. Thanks, thanks Joanna. Um, so that we can do critical things. If you don't have that strategy, you, you can't measure yourself, you can't prioritize, especially when you've got competing public goods. Now the best strategies are, are, are just a couple of words. Right, what was the, what's the most successful national security strategy we ever had? Containment, a single word. And in the US, we might have disagreed um, between how to go, go about containment. We might have disagreed on the tactics of it, but everyone agreed on the same strategy. So what the New York Cyber Task Force has been doing is saying, well, let's take the idea of, of a more defensible cyberspace, and let's take that as that central strategy. So how can we make our own enterprise more defensible? How can we make our sector more defensible, our nation's cyberspace as a whole? And so as we'll talk about defensible is solutions that have, um, def that advantage the defense and that scale most easily. So 
as I mentioned, we've had these quotes back from 1979 that talks about how the attacker will always get through. And so we frame that of saying, look, attack is easier than defense um, because of the asymmetry of the offense. And people like John Mallory and others have done good work on this about how scale aids the attacker more than it does the defender. If they put in an hour, if they put in a dollar, they get way more for that dollar than we do as defenders. Now, you've got, you know, as every information security person has their favorite reasons why that's true. I'm not going to go through this list. I hope your favorite reason is on there. Um, you know, internet architecture wasn't designed to be secure. Software weaknesses, we've got to patch everything. They only have to be right once. Um, uh, and on and on through the entire list um, of complexity, sentient opponents, you know, we can't just build it, we have to continue to do it over time. But we've got, <laughs> it really struck me when we were doing this list because we just keep adding these reasons of why the attacker has the, adva has the advantage. And so we can try and keep adding in incremental solutions all the time to fix this, but then that just aids the complexity um, and doesn't necessarily get us any farther. So we formed this New York Cyber Task Force. It's only in New York in the fact that most of us are located there. Um, officially, our university is Columbia University in the city of New York, and so we tried to get together with um, uh, media CISOs, uh, the bank CISOs, other academics, uh, some people up from Washington, D.C., like Angela McKay, um, to try and take on these main questions. Um, what would a de more defensible cyberspace look like? Why hasn't it been defensible to date? We just talked about that part. Um, what are the past innovations that we've done that have made the most difference, and what made them important? And then what lessons can we take from those innovations, and what does that inform us about what we ought to do next? So really quickly, defensible just meant defense advantage. What can we do that, can, is it even thinkable to talk about a, a cyberspace where the defender has the advantage? We have the high ground. Um, and so it has to have, an internet would have to have these kinds of, um, of characteristics. What we really thought was the main part, was really the main part to me, is what are the innovations, the interventions that we've done in the past that has made the biggest difference? And I really came across this because it was about eh, maybe almost three years ago, The Economist um, ran an article on climate change. And they said, well, what interventions have we done that have taken the most carbon dioxide equivalent out of the environment? And, and, and top one was, was the Montreal Protocol. And, and many of you might not have even heard of that. That was the CFCs. And it wasn't even meant to be about climate change specifically. It was meant to be about the ozone layer. And you can see it was as effective as, as almost everything else combined, and it was far cheaper. And they said, well, one, as far as we can tell, almost no one has ever asked the question this way. What have we done that's made the biggest difference? And uh, <laughs> I was reading thinking, well, what have we as cyber defenders done that has made the biggest difference? And as far as I could tell, we'd never really asked the question that way before. So we jumped in and we said, all right, the solutions that we're looking for are going to have these two um, characteristics. It um, has to be defense advantage. So to be an important innovation, it has to cost us less to implement it than it takes the bad guys to take it down. And better yet, if it can do that at scale, if we can make the scale of the internet help us more than it helps the defenders. So if you're doing this innovation, can it scale across the in, uh, all of the internet, all of cyberspace, um, uh, pretty much automatically? So I'm just going to, uh, we'll, we'll provide these, uh, we'll provide these slides, the report's going to be out, I'm not going to read all of them. But what we did was we said some of these innovations are technology and some are within the enterprise. Those are the ones that we know best and that we're most familiar with. Firewalls, passwords, intrusion detection systems. But we've also got technological innovations that have worked across cyberspace as a whole. Windows update. When we went out and talked to, to um, cyber experts, professionals in the business, when we said what innovations have made the most difference, Windows Update was one of those that just kept coming up. <laughs> yeah, Jan is doing a little <coughs> um, and, um, 
But are, are these automated update is one of these technological innovations that helped across cyberspace as a whole because it gave scale to defenders. But we also looked at operational and policy innovations because we too frequently forget these. Right? We had to invent an organization called a computer emergency response team. We had to invent a role called CISO in 1995. Um, you know, uh, and, and Kim brought up Morris Worm, right? We had, after the Morris Worm, we said, man, we need something like a CERT. And so we, a lot of times we don't think about those organal, organizational innovations. Some of those organizational innovations helped across cyberspace as a whole, like NANOG, that, that got, has gotten mentioned a couple of times today, and the operator group, the threat alliances, um, even just the rise of the security industry it, itself. And we also had the policy innovations. Now, as we get farther to the right, as we get to the policy innovations, it's tougher to judge whether it's been really important or not. Because generally, when you have, as you get farther to the right, you've got winners and losers, and it's a little tougher to figure out um, how to measure it, whether there are real wins. But some certainly like information sharing, right? That started with a presidential directive in, in the US um, in 1998. That then led to the organizational innovation of creating information sharing and analysis centers. That then led to automated threat sharing and indicators that then led to technical innovations within the enterprise. Uh, for policy, we also include, for example, the Budapest Convention, um, and other areas like that that have affected across cyberspace as a whole. So, and, the, and these will be out in our, uh, in our report shortly. So we said, boy, you know, some of these innovations worked um, in these different ways. Some of them were hardening an asset, some were helping organizational and management structure, others were tied to education or situational awareness. Um, and we have all of these assigned and you'll see when, when the report comes out. Now, the strategy isn't just do more of the good stuff. It's also start deinvesting in the, in the not so good stuff. And we had some of those that certainly came up. Um, policy, you know, the Vossenar agreement. We had a lot of, uh, one, of, one of the cybersecurity companies said before Vossenar they needed 10 export licenses. With Vossenar, they stopped counting at around 1,000 and how many they might need. Um, how was it original? Uh, originally expected. Ch uh, check, box, uh, check the box compliant solutions got brought up by pretty much everyone as operational innovations that had largely lived past. Um, and then uh, technologists had innovations past their expiration date because it really struck us as we were going through and looking for the important innovations of seeing this curve. Um, we, we call it from essential to albatross in, in the report where the innovations start being amazing and you've got to use these, like passwords, right? Passwords were absolutely critical when they came out, fundamental to computer security when they came out, until, until a few years ago when everyone at SciCon and RSA and, and Black Hat and, oh my God, passwords, why are we still using passwords, right? Um, and, but now with two-factor authentication, right? I mean, now with other means, they've bounced back a bit. And so we've got to recognize where we are on this chart when it comes to the innovations. And we don't want to lock in the innovations with regulation or legislation so that we're stuck with an expired innovation that we can't then um, roll out and, and re-engineer or, or re-up. Um, so what are the lessons from that? So we, we found these were the three main lessons that we took away from this. Um, that the best innovations have scale is massively in the favor of the defense. And that can happen in a couple ways, and you can see the, um, uh, some of the ways that the people that we talked to um, uh, here, uh, these are, uh, these four, those responsible make, it, uh, make a change, take the user out of the solution, take away entire class of attacks. Those overlap quite a bit. It's just a different way of thinking about the problem. Uh, the second one is uses the least interve intervention necessary. This is a similar point to the first one, but is a, is a little bit easier formulation to think about um, policy and operational issues. Um, and what, one of the ways we mean by tried and true governance structures or solutions is if, you, if we regulate for transparency rather than regulating for security, for example, transparency solutions can help align the market incentives um, and in ways that if you regulate for security, you might, um, you might or may not get the, the result that you want. Transparency as a first step might, might, might be better. 
And lastly, operational policy in innovations um, are powerful but often overlooked. Technologists tend not to understand the operational and policy tools um, or underestimate them, um, whereas the, um, the policy folks sometimes don't understand the full implications of, their, uh, of what they're proposing. Okay. Um, we had a few things that came out and we called them curveballs, where we're not really sure which direction they're going to go. Um, this morning, Ralph talked about security automation and he showed the, uh, the supercomputers. Um, uh, but I like, uh, but Paul Nicholas brought this up. It's too early to tell whether bringing in automation is going to help the offense more than the defense. I personally am more worried that the attackers with the supercomputers are going to do better than, than the defenders with the supercomputers. Um, that it's more likely that automation on balance is going to aid the attackers. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. It's certainly one of those that we couldn't say, yep, automation, supercomputers are, are, are going to solve the problem because they might not. They might, make it, they might make it worse on balance. Um, so we looked at what are some of the important upcoming defensive in, uh, innovations. And I'll leave that up there for the folks that are taking, uh, taking the photos. But again, the report should be out um, uh, not too long. Oh, and uh, this summarizes what, what some of those innovations we're going to be doing. Um, so within technology, we had, um, we brought these up. Uh, I was shocked when I, when I went into this. Um, to me, I was still on the fence about cloud technologies and whether they were going to overall help security. Um, and I was just really surprised and impressed at how much the, the technologists around the table um, were pushing and saying, no, we haven't even begun to see the real gains that we're going to get from cloud. You know, Steve Belevin, um, Phil Venables, Ed Amoroso, um, all saying, no, you ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to the cloud. The, um, obviously, some of the others migrating from passwords, more secure code. Um, it surprised me a little bit as we're going through this to see the, re the return of formal methods. You know, something that I learned, and I, you know, it was only really for the laboratory, um, but is really coming out what DARPA has been doing, um, what Microsoft has been doing. For example, to use uh, inexpensive formal methods to write new HTTPS. Um, so that way you've got a far more secure internet standards. Um, quantum encryption. Uh, and then we, we looked at some of these operational and policy issues as well. Um, that these, again, summarize some of those um, innovations that were on the previous slide. The, uh, I'm adding, um, so these are the ones that we thought were a little bit easier, that people have come out with, um, I don't think we have any brand new ideas here um, per se, but these were the innovations that we thought most were matching what we could do at scale. We came out with some innovations that we, th that certainly work at scale, but when you're getting into these, you have to decide who pays. Um, and who pays and who's going to suffer is a much more difficult decision on this slide than it is on, on the earlier ones. You know, for example, using defensive worms to go and patch systems. Like, make sure we don't have another Mirai by writing a counter Mirai that's going to go around and patch those systems. That certainly works at scale. It's certainly inexpensive. It's far easier than trying to convince everybody to patch their systems. But obviously, it has a lot of downsides if it's not done well. And we think all of these have those. So the task force didn't have agreement on these. But we did say, well, these, uh, we don't have consensus, but at least these are important. Um, that certainly fit leverage as we've been talking about it, but we couldn't talk, um, that we weren't going to recommend ourselves. So the recommendations that we have, we've got some for US government in e and the EU, um, as well as recommendations for technology and cybersecurity companies, as well as organizations dependent on technology. And um, again, I don't think there's anything that you haven't seen on other slides at, at 30 other conferences. But hopefully, by trying to be rigorous about how we're getting to this, I think we've got a lot more confidence in, in our answers than, than um, we have when we've made similar recommendations in the past. Uh, so just to close, here's, um, here is our story. So we think 
the internet can be more defensible. Defense is possible. Um, we can do better, but we've got to recognize what's working and what isn't. Continuing to go, all right, we've got a thousand tools. If we've got a thousand and one tools out there, we're really going to make a difference. That's, that's not helping. That's, we've been in the same situation for decades. Um, again, that quote from 1979 that the attackers always get through. So that means everything we've done since 1979, the tens of billions of dollars we've spent, the missed birthdays, the missed weekends, um, all of the patents that have been issued have been at best to break even. Sometimes I don't even know why people listen to us anymore. Like it's been decades and we haven't fixed this yet. So we think we need to start looking at um, some of these tougher solutions. We need to have the right strategy of where are we going to get the most leverage and putting the bulk of our investment into those investments. I like how Paul Nicholas said it earlier in talking about tipping points. The bad guys have had the advantage for decades. So how long can a system stay in equilibrium where the attackers have the, the advantage year after year, decade after decade? How long can you still keep that in balance? Right now, the attacker has the advantage. Maybe if we don't do things right, the attacker is going to have supremacy. And then instead of the internet being a, a global human right, it becomes a luxury good. So we think we need to start doing changes now. We think those changes are reasonable if we, do, if we choose the right strategy. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Jay. I'm always surprised, um, actually, when security experts um, actually are recommending the cloud. I, I've just been, I, I, I don't see the point in that because if you're putting all the data in one place, it obviously makes it, uh, the targets um, much more reduced. But, um, so I wanted to ask you just uh, briefly that we, you talked about some of the successes and, and the ones, the solutions that um, operated at a wide scale and also cost the attackers. Um, are there specific ones that were just outright losers that you thought were um, hands down things that we never should have done or? <clears throat> I, on the, I, I get a good quote from a, a colleague that uh, runs a, a poll between security professionals every month. And he found that we are up to 52% of security professionals and organizations have buyer's remorse. That, so more than half of the time when someone buys a new tool, when a CISO buys a new tool, they go, oh, man, damn it, why did I buy that, <laughs> right? And so I, that really struck me that this is so high so I don't think it's anyone, especially on the technological side, like any that was a bad technology mm -hmm. um, that got us there. But I think it's the collection of technologies that themselves, you know, it's this incrementalism of all I need is these additional tools. I now see this new uh, attack X. I now need an anti X tool right. um, rather than the more generalized solutions. And I think it'll be very interesting to see if we can get the venture capital and the R&D community to start to putting more investment in these root solutions rather than, hey, I've got a new security company that has a new widget. This widget's gonna s sell really well and, and we chase after right. that. So, so those, um, those larger solutions, um, this isn't a question about individual products, but it's about, you talked about um, the solutions that, that did succeed in terms of being wide scale and, and costing attackers. Um, passwords, firewalls, uh, Windows update. All of those things are geared toward the end user, though, and the client side. And they don't really get at the core infrastructure problems that we're facing, that we've seen with Heartbleed, that we see <laughs> with SS7, that we see with BGP uh, routing hijacking, things like that. Um, those 20-year-old code problems in open source software that no one ever, ever bothered to look at. So what is the solution there? I mean, who should take leadership over addressing those kinds of solutions? And really, how should we go about it? Well, what I really liked after Heartbleed was when you saw uh, the big cybersecurity companies, the platform companies and others, and starting to jump in and say, you know what, we're, we're critically dependent on some of these small bits of technology that we're all using that are open source and don't have a lot. And they were steering funding into those. That's not. That's not the absolute solution. Um, I would love to start seeing on top of that 
DHS grants that are matching that, of saying, um, let's come out, uh, it, would have been, it was my number one recommendation for this, admin, for this administration. Um, we go back and we look at how, when we've had major cyber incidents, Conficker, Heartbleed, Counter APT, Denial of Service attacks, who actually did what to solve the problem? And that we go through in a disciplined way to figure out what organizations, what people made, took what actions, made what decisions based on what information, what happened then. And we then use that to steer the next National Cyber Incident Response Plan. We then step in and say, all right, what information could they have used? And that's where we try and steer DHS. Are there some organizations in there, like the Open SSH, that are trying to do too much with too little, and we try and steer DHS grants and other money towards them? So not having government take a leadership role in that, but a, just a funding role, since, uh, since the real knowledge is actually in the, the tech co community. Correct. Now, that doesn't fully solve the problem that, that you just talked about, but I was just trying to stall until Jan goes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to weigh in on that question? I mean, I, so I think generally I, I would agree with everything um, which was on uh, everything yeah. Jay said. Um, I would probably just add, from our perspective, we actually. Uh, ha do believe that the cloud actually is a is a is a net positive for for security, and I think actually there's great great security innovation that happens uh, through cloud computing. Um, there are um, hundreds of new cloud security features that come out in our cloud service uh, every year alone. Uh, there is um, you 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 get sort of the the scale effect of security. You talked about hyperscale mm -hmm. in your presentation, and I think you know when we when we're able to mitigate against threats against a particular customer, a group of customers. Uh, those learnings and those benefits then actually benefit everyone using that, that service. And I think that's mm -hmm. the kind of scale effect that you're really getting in a cloud environment that you wouldn't necessarily get in the traditional on-prem environment. So I think there is a lot more there to, that we probably need to all do a better job of explaining some of those benefits. But. And, and, and also to answer your question on what do we do about the, the, the legacy base, uh, it, it really strikes me in, in one of the things that uh, Paul Nicholas talked about earlier in, in the need for new organizations. Um, he was bringing it up for the attribution organization. But it strikes me that you could say, all right, do we have a, um, can we go through and say, all right, what are all of these individual pieces that we're, that we're most critical on? Where are these, what are the organizations that are supporting this? And start building new organizations to support them. And I don't think that's, uh, we can do a better job at that. What I talked about was a little bit more ad hoc of how we can start, for example, steering grants to them. Mm -hmm. but, it, but we might look at a new, oh my god, I'm going to say it, public-private sector partnership. I never <laughs> say that word, um, I those words. you info-sharing now. And, um, <laughs> but you could imagine some new hybrid organization that's going to say, all right, let's look at where all the, the, the legacy code that we're most dependent on, these legacy standards, and what is, how are we going to step up to try and do that? And you can imagine DHS s and in that. You can imagine the platform companies involved in that, some of the cybersecurity companies. Mm -hmm. So you talked about Windows Update being sort of this game changer. Um, but again, it was a game changer for individual users, and it doesn't really get at sort of the enterprise problem that we have, where patching doesn't happen automatically. Um, and in particular, if we're talking about critical infrastructure, industrial control systems, right. patching might happen once a year, yeah. even maybe not even that often. How do we solve this problem? And, the, and you know, WannaCry was a kind of, I don't want to say wake up call, um, but it was a reminder um, that waiting just even two months to install a patch that was available, uh, it can be detrimental to an organization. How do we solve that enterprise patching problem? How do we make it go faster, um, less painful for our enterprises? A lot of it comes down to the, to the governance structure within, within the organization itself. Um, and what I mean by that, the, I've seen, for example, banks that said, well, you know what, we're going to keep running this Windows XP because we're still making millions of dollars on it. Um, you know, it's running this old code, but it's this great app and we don't want to rewrite it. And, and the CISO does, says, okay, great, you've got a waiver, no big deal, um, because the business has oomph. If the organization has the right structure, there's a governance committee Right, it goes to the board. You need a waiver. You say, all right, you're going to run obsolete software. You make $2 million from it. That's at the end a risk that's going to go to the shareholders of the, for a publicly traded company. Right? The 
the shareholder, the board of directors is there to represent the shareholders and make sure the company is making the right risk decisions. So after we have things like WannaCry, where those decisions now impact the entire organization, right? Companies, especially publicly traded companies, need a better process so that when one part of the firm is holding the others at risk, that you've got a process to go through for ob obsolete software. And that fits its way through patching too. Right? I'd been with Goldman Sachs a couple of times and it used to be that we would fully test the patches before we pushed them out. Our patch cycle was 30 to 45 days. Um, and then one day, the CISO, Phil Venables, just said, no, we're patching it out to everyone. And if you fail, and if, and if the product fails, um, it fails in the development environment, and then you roll it back. You roll it out in the, in, you test it, I mean, you roll it out in the development environment, if it fails, you roll it back, and we didn't get affected by worms anymore. I mean, they stopped. And because we rolled it out with the presumption it was going to work, and then only if it failed in development would those folks then use the old version. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to me, those kinds of governance models, those kinds of operational processes, I, I think they can work. You um, talk about, I don't know if you mentioned it here, but in your report, you talked about how the task force um, didn't agree on or shied away from uh, um, imposing responsibility or liability on software makers um, and, and device makers as well. Um, what was the reason for that? Was that just because it would be too hard to determine who's liable for vulnerable software? Uh, and I want to say you, you, the caveat was not just any software, but software that has known vulnerabilities and that they've re simply refused to patch. Um, and I'm not sure that everyone would agree if, if that's a wise caveat or if it actually should be broader. Yeah. Um, but what was the reason for why everyone was opposed to that? Um, Honestly, I didn't even try to push, as executive director, I wasn't even trying to push it because I thought it would take, a, you know, we meet usually for an hour and a half uh, at a time, and I thought that would take us six meetings to get through if, if for, for example, is that more important than ISPs not passing the trash? Is that more important than some of the other, you know, than active defense? Um, and when it came down to it, I thought getting the consensus among 30 members um, we were never going to get there, get all the way to consensus on that. And so we focused on, well, what are the things that we really do definitely agree on? Um, we did agree in, uh, in these areas of greater transparency. Um, so software bill of materials, for example, um, so that way you know what's in the code that you're getting. You know, the things that Mudge and Sarah Zatka were doing with the cyber independent testing labs, consumer reports. The nutrition labels uh, for right, software. Right, the nutrition labels for software. Consumer reports is now starting to add um, cyber vulnerability, cyber risk in their, in their consumer reports reviews. Um, so uh, these are all things that I think can help and are an important step that comes before I think we need to get to liability. Uh, so I'm going to open up to questions in just a minute, so um, get prepared. But I just wanted to ask one other question um, with regard to government role in defense of uh, large enterprises. Mm -hmm. Something interesting came up in the Sony hack. After Sony was hacked and the government attributed that to North Korea, um, the reason for why the government said that it could do that attribution was mm -hmm. because it was so deeply embedded, or this, this is what was reported, was that it was so deeply embedded in the North Korean systems that it could actually see the negotiations going on around the attack or even post the attack. And so the logical question that came up with then was, well, if the government is in these systems, why couldn't it have anticipated the attack and warned Sony? So regardless of whether or not the case existed mm -hmm. in that particular uh, circumstance for them to have that ability. Should the government be in that business because, let's say, particularly the US government, but there are other governments that also have that ability to see a wider view of the network. Should the governments be in the job of warning and anticipating tax and maybe even thwarting them with the hack back or some of the other kinds of defensive, active defense techniques? Yeah, the, the way I usually approach this is in cyber conflict, the private sector is the supported command, not the supporting command. And um, for, for a while, the U.S. government had the view of, well, what's the private sector going to do to help the U.S. government solve the problem? And that generally has it completely reversed. It's almost always the private sector that's actually fixing the problem. And so wherever possible, the government, for the most part, has to help the private sector. The private sector has subject matter expertise, they have agility, and they have, um, 
the ability to, to change the physics of cyberspace. Mark Sox used to say, he, he worked for Verizon, look, we can bend cyberspace if we need to. The government don't, can't do any of that well, um, any government. But what the government has, it's got access, uh, um, it's got far more massive resources, at least, at least the US. That gives it incredible staying power, and it has access, access to other levers of power. Can arrest people if we need to, we can stab people if we have to. Um, and so the best mix is gonna be bringing both of these together. So I think there can be a role in that, um, for the US government in that, um, but it's gonna be a relatively high threshold um, you know, maybe not an attack on Sony, but, 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 um, um, but maybe an attack on elect electrical sector. Um, and so I think it's going to be an interesting balance as we, as we work through what that best relationship is to get those strengths from the private sector as well as the strengths of the public sector. Are there questions in the audience? Anyone up here? Oh, go ahead. Hi, I'm George, a student at Glasgow University. Uh, my question is, um, you mentioned the worm that can actually patch, force it patch the computers that are not patched already. So is it bringing more harm than it benefits? Right. And the second question is about role of insurance companies, which can basically raise the fees for not being uh, timely updated. What do you think about that? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, on the worm, the, the best example out there is the Welchia worm, which was 2003, the age of the great worms, when all the worms were hitting companies, and Blaster had just come out. And it affected many, many of our organizations here. And someone wrote Welchia to go in, and it would um, infect computers. It would download the patch from Microsoft that would, fix, that would not let Blaster in, and if Blaster was there, it would try and delete it. Um, so of course, that, you know, that is not something that has taken off as a great idea. It's generally seen as a dumb idea, I think, in the community because of the chance that it's gonna do a lot more damage, right? If we're worried about patching with a legitimate patch, then what's an illegitimate patch going to do? But it certainly does have scale. The idea is starting to come back. It's, called an it's being called a do-gooder or an ethical worm. And you know, we, I, I felt like we needed to at least include it, especially since we'd just come through WannaCry. Insurance, insurance is, is the darling of Washington DC and other, and other capitals right now, because this is the way that we've handled so many of other similar problems like this. Um, I think it's still gonna be a while because we don't have a, a good enough understanding of the risk um, in enough cases, right? Is this, how many of the cyber risks we're facing are like life insurance? where you can have a good actuarial set of what's going to happen because you've got a nice range, you know what's going to happen, versus how much of it is fire insurance or hurricane insurance or flood insurance, where you get, you might not see anything for a couple of years and then you get a massive hit because you've, got a lar because you've had a large scale outage. So that's why I like pushing the transparency. I think the risk metrics and things like that um, can help align those market forces um, SEC guidance, things like that for more mandatory reporting so that way we can get a better sense of what's happening and that, and that I think helps align the markets in ways that will make the insurance more effective. Right now I think we're maybe only $10 billion in, in premiums written right now and that's, that's very, very tiny. I think it's going to be a long way still. Hello, Olaf, Olaf Kolkman, Internet Society. Oh. Um, just as a follow-up to the, the, the botnet that's going around, a bricker bot that fixes Mirai vulnerabilities by right, right, just right, right. breaking the devices. Yeah. Um, you can have all kinds of question marks yeah. with that. But uh, my question was actually more around, uh, I think it's a clarifying question. Hmm. The way that I look at your presentation without having the benefit of having seen the report, I'm really looking forward to oh, it, thank you. Um, is I think that all solutions with respect to cybersecurity come from evolution. Mm. So I've been looking at your list through that lens, and my feeling is by looking at it, perhaps with the exception of quantum uh, cryptography, quantum, quantum computing, um, that there are no paradigm shifts or very profound shifts in uh, of the things that we can do. The, the, the industry is already uh, moving to, uh, mm. uh, uh, to the cloud. Um, 
uh, f fundamental methods of, of code security have been looked at in academia for years and years and years, and they're getting better. People are funding um, uh, uh, software libraries, and and I'm not. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing that that taking a strategic position here is is a, is 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 a bad thing. But I was wondering about is there a paradigm shift that you see? On the technological side, I would certainly think that the initial thinking of the cloud itself was right. I mean, um, yeah. Now that we're now that we're in midstream, it doesn't seem like it was very big. But I mean, it really has been a big change. I think if there's some somewhere that I might say where you're seeing the paradigms, especially because to me paradigms is about a mindset, right? And so take Intel-driven operations and the cyber kill chain, right? Those had a significant difference. I mean, especially the kill chain, right? That's, that's just an idea of a way to think about stopping the adversary, of what the adversary has to do to get into your system. And just you think about it and you say, good, now what do I do different to try and do that? And boy, if that's not a clear paradigm in itself, it's, it's a doctrine, it's a thought, and it's changed the business. And that, and that really was one of the, my favorite examples of an operational innovation that's free, <laughs> I mean, it's low cost, and yet can fundamentally change the way, that we, the, the way that we think about defensive operations. And yet we, time and time again, we don't think about operational innovation. We don't think about process innovation. We jump into what's our new technology that we have to buy. Any more questions? Hi, I'm Matthias Schulze from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Thanks for the presentation, really nice handiwork collecting the arguments, and I'm really looking forward to the report. What struck me, and you probably oh, thought about I that in the group, um, what about the economy here? I mean, most of the problems, patch cycles, malware as a service, etc. These are not tech problems, these are econo economic problems. Because it's, there's a lot of bang for the buck producing black hat software, so to speak. So shouldn't we think about this issue from an economic perspective? Like, for example, we look at the global drug market, which is a big market and a big problem and is probably not going away. But the problem started with the increased war on drugs in the 70s, right? So maybe there's a parallel here that our way of fighting the problem increases incentives and financial gain for the bad guys. So we need, maybe we should need to think about economic solutions for that. Yeah, and I, 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 think, you're, I, I think you're right on that. And we can, um, a, bun a bunch of things are running through my head. Because as we're talking about this idea, I mean, it is kind of obvious when you think about it, right? That we should do the things that have the biggest impact, right? I mean, if you, if when phrased like that, people are like, oh, okay. Um, and some would say, well, well, what you mean is ROI. And I'm like, well, no, we don't mean ROI necessarily because um, that's only thinking about the, de you know, the defensive side. And others said, well, you mean imposing costs on the bad guy, especially the military folks. And, well, no, we don't just mean imposing costs because we've got to think about our own costs as well. And so you're right, it is in the, the, this full mix. There's no doubt there's plenty of people in the business. There's no HR problem. The market is working absolutely fantastically, and there's plenty of innovation. It's just that too much of those things are aiding the bad guys more, <laughs> more, than, um, more than it's aiding us. One reason why we couldn't agree, and this is to Kim's, one of Kim's questions, on some of those, uh, those harder choices, was that it's not just who pays at the end of the day, it's the hit to innovation. I mean, if we're hitting, if we're, if we're looking at, at stricter liability, Microsoft is probably gonna be able to get through that because they've got great lawyers. Um, the smaller companies and the startups aren't going to be able to, so we know it's gonna have this differential impact on innovation um, that we just, we just haven't thought, that we haven't thought through yet. And so I think about, in getting to the paradigm question of Moloff earlier, how might we disrupt their, their, their economics? You know, if we know there are ASs or there are other um, bits of infrastructure that seem to be predominantly used for, for criminal purposes, what can we do about that? I've even tried to think about, all right, instead of regulating ISPs to say you can't pass trash, let's have a cap and trade system, right? <laughs> you, you can pollute this much, and if, you, and, if you, and if you're a crappier network than this, then you've got to buy credits from someone else or you get taxed above that level. 
maybe that's a stupid idea, but it starts to change the way that we think about this um, into not just regulating for security, but trying to find some of these other ways, other ways to do it. And, and I love what we do for the drug war. We were saying, let's not make it illegal. Let's, let's focus on the harm that it causes and let's try and treat it as a public health issue for the harm. You know, that's an inter interesting set of ideas that might come from that. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jay. Uh, let's move on to Jan's presentation. Sure. Um, and in terms of um, Microsoft's uh, policy initiatives, um, they have released, they are released, all the three of those, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so they have released um, three documents. Uh, one is on a digital Geneva Convention, uh, one was on attribution, and the third one was on a tech. Um, global tech accord. Global yeah. tech accord. Yeah. Great, thanks very much, Kim, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be back at Psycho. And I just tried to count earlier. I think this is my fifth or sixth in a row, and uh, just uh, it's fascinating to see every year this conference is getting better, attracting uh, just a great, great mix of people. So uh, great to see so many of you here. I will try to build a little bit on what my colleague Paul Nicholas elaborated on or, or presented to you this this morning, uh, and maybe add um, some additional sort of thinking and and, and concepts around uh, what, what was discussed earlier in the day. I, I will actually try and skip through the presentation fairly quickly so we can leave some time for, for Q&A. Uh, and so among that, I think, I, I, among this group, I don't need to go into the details around the economic impact uh, caused by cyber attacks, but maybe just to point out that when we look at some of these uh, numbers, and, and many of you have, have, have seen similar things, and there's many companies out there that uh, have uh, different ways of calculating some of these impacts. When we look at some of the uh, estimated costs from cyber attacks, the projections between now and 2020 reaching uh, up to $3 trillion, and this is, I think, in relation to lost productivity gain, uh, those con consequences are, are, are significant and they're severe. Uh, other interesting data, of course, the, the median number of days between infiltration and detection. Many of us are looking at that as sort of an indicator. Are things getting better? Uh, are we on the right trajectory? And we're still sort of, by most accounts, hovering around 140 uh, plus days, and that's, that's just simply still too long. And so I think the work that Jay and, and others are doing in that regard to kind of, let's try and focus on what are the things that really make a big difference and make a big impact are, are, are critical. What you'll see from, from, from what we're talking about, of course, is to layer on top of many of the technological innovations, we're fundamentally believing that we also need innovation in sort of our policy thinking and strategic approaches to, to cyber. And part of that, of course, involves government's roles in cyberspace. And I think many of you are very familiar with the, the ways that governments approach cyber, how government roles have changed and evolved over the years. I was here, I believe, last year to talk about that in more detail. Uh, but from our perspective, it is fascinating that we're seeing this sort of duality of governments both investing more in cyber operations, both offense and defense. And those numbers are estimates, they're not our numbers, those are sort of taken from, from news reports, what you see up there. Um, at the same time, uh, we're also seeing governments developing cyber legislation and strategies to actually move more into a regulatory uh, framework around cybersecurity. Maybe not as much in, in the US yet, but certainly here in Europe, we've seen uh, things like the Network Information Security Directive, which are very much taking the approach um, uh, to try and address what, 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 is, uh, what many say is a, is a market failure when it comes to security. And so I think um, we, have, we have both of those trends going on at, at the same time. Uh, I think we mentioned earlier that, uh, I believe Paul mentioned it, but if he didn't, I'll, I'll repeat it. You know, from a Microsoft perspective, we spend over a billion dollars a year on cybersecurity. Uh, and we have over 3,500 engineers at the company working on cybersecurity. And I think that's a significant investment that is, I think, hard to rival. But when you look at some of these other investments that governments are making in this space, uh, you start asking yourself, you know, how much can we actually accomplish with a with, with billion dollars on, on, on defense? So from that, I think, then stem concerns around a number of alleged uh, in many cases, uh, nation state cyber attacks, and we'll get to the question of attribution. Uh, but there certainly is the sense that those alleged attacks, 
that are getting more complex are contributing to this, to this sort of feeling of rising cyber insecurity. Uh, we are uh, almost to the date, 10 years after the 2007 attacks on Estonia, and when you look at what actually happened back then, the, the, sort of the, the volume or the level of intensity, if you will, of those DDoS attacks actually pales in comparison to what is possible today. And I think it, when we take that and many other indicators for how attacks are getting more complex and more sophisticated and the tools that are being used, uh, it, 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 is, it is fairly clear that we do actually need to think about a paradigm shift here. And so what's the, what's the very quickly, what's the current state of play when it comes to those international debates? From our perspective, um, there are a number of existing international fora, there's a lot of intergovernmental discussion around cybersecurity and uh, the use of ICTs for, for peace and security. Uh, many of you would uh, have followed the, the recent UNGGE discussions, the government group of experts, which is concluding its work uh, this time around again in, in June in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and, and, and the work that has been going on there also in the G7 and other groups, absolutely foundational, fundamental, I think, to uh, starting down this path and continuing this path on uh, getting to, 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 this, to this paradigm shift, I think, that we're, that we're needing to, to see. But one of the challenges, I think, is that these discussions continue to be sort of taking place mostly between and among governments. There is a broadening that has taken place over the last few years, and we very much welcome that. But we also fundamentally believe that we need to get more actors involved in these international cyber policy and cyber norms discussions, not just global ICT providers such as Microsoft, and we have been trying to contribute to that, to that discussion, but also many of the actual of the underlying infrastructures, the, the critical infrastructures, some of the sort of digital infrastructure, the, the, the telco providers, and many of the assurance organizations, they all have important experiences that they need to share, and they need to be, be taking part in, uh, in, in, in these discussions. Challenges, there really is a limited number of public-private platforms where this is being discussed. Uh, we have with us, I think, in the room many of the commissioners of the newly established uh, commission launched by the Dutch government uh, for the stability of, of cyberspace, who will have a meeting later this week. And, and that, I think, is, is exactly the right approach to try and actually formulate ideas that can contribute to these processes. Other efforts, such as the, the London process, as it's known, the global conferences on cyberspace, have played an important role There'll be another one of those later this year in, in India. And uh, then, of course, you have some, some related efforts on capacity building in cyberspace that is now looking at not just advancing technological capacity building, but also working with countries to actually make a sort of difference in maturing some of the policy processes, which, which we think is, is important. But so where are we today from our perspective and what is missing? We have a very robust discussion, I think a, a maturing discussion around existing legal frameworks and the sort of broadly speaking the applicability of international humanitarian law uh, in cyberspace. There was a discussion earlier today here at the, at the conference. Uh, we are, I think, in complete agreement uh, with those that, that, that say, and I think there is a growing majority uh, that of, of, of states that believe that international law does apply to cyberspace, and that is foundational, I think, for everything we're trying to achieve in this, in this space. The challenge is really sort of this, this uh, threshold for, for, for where international law actually starts applying, and those are in situations of, of armed conflict. And many of the attacks I, I showed you earlier really still, from our perspective at least, would not necessarily have reached into, into, that, into that category of, of attacks. And so we continue to be in a situation where we do have a gray area, where you have activity taking place, for which the rules simply aren't as clear. Now, let me be clear, the Talon Manual 2.0, and I will be the first to admit I have not read the whole document, and I show hands who has read it all, cover to cover. Okay. <laughs> Two. <laughs> I just ordered my copy on Amazon. But um, the, um, I think that the, the, the challenge is that the Talon Manual uh, 2.0 is, 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 has tried to make an important contribution in, in that regard, and, and we are seeing increased reference and discussions to that. It's, it's, it's a fairly new document, um, and the success of, of efforts like that will, of course, depend on how states will ultimately act in practice. It's about state practice, right? If we're trying to create customary international law, um, 
that is, is, is ultimately what, what, what really is a key component. And so what um, we have proposed, what our president, Brad Smith, uh, came out uh, at this point, I think three months ago, at the RSA conference in San Francisco, is he used this term that there was a need to create a digital Geneva Convention. And what we mean, or what he meant by that, was a set of peacetime rules and mechanisms to help protect civilians in cyberspace, uh, again, in times of peace. And so what I wanted to briefly share with you, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to get into sort of questions around it, because I think there may have also been sort of a, uh, I'm not sure if it's a set of misunderstandings or, or some questions around what we actually meant, but I just want to be very clear. This idea has three components, and these are the papers that you, that you mentioned earlier, Kim. On the one hand, we have been calling on governments, and we've been doing that for some time now, to actually evolve and agree on a set of norms that over time could evolve into something that is legally binding, uh, that, that would help protect civilians and civilian infrastructure uh, below that threshold of armed conflict. The second piece is related to what industry should be doing, because it's very clear to us, not really sufficient to just be calling from an industry perspective on governments to do certain things, and so we are very uh, sort of keen on, 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 on trying to leverage some best practices, existing best practices, such as 0% offense, 100% defense, among, in particular, among global sort of platform uh, ICT providers. And then the third piece relates to the attribution uh, effort, stemming from the belief that if you develop norms of behavior, if you even evolve it into international, customary international law or other sort of legally binding uh, forms, you still need a mechanism to hold those that violate those norms uh, accountable or better accountable. And so I think Paul, Paul already talked uh, to a degree about the attribution piece, and I'll save that for the end. But I just wanted to come back to this question of, well, what do you mean when you talk about norms? What are some of the things that, that from an industry or a Microsoft perspective, are, are, are relevant to you? And so we've tried to sort of evolve this and group it into, into two, um, two, two um, uh, groups, essentially, of, 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 of norms. One, to say, Governments really shall not do things like imper impact uh, uh, or, or attack systems whose destruction would, would uh, uh, adversely impact safety and security of civilians, uh, impact the global economy, insert back doors into, into global mass ICT products, uh, steal intellectual property of private companies. And I think we've actually seen some uptake of, of, some, of some of these things that in some cases we've been advocating for years. In, in some of the more formal processes, be it the GGE or other uh, governments coming out with uh, statements that, that, are, that are somewhat uh, similar. But then there's also, of course, sort of the, the more proactive side of things or, or the uh, uh, sort of making sure that governments act in order to actually achieve something. And so I think this, this question of restraint in developing weapons and the, and the, and the restraint in, in proliferating weapons is something that's, that's vital. Uh, and, then, and then sort of tied to that, uh, a norm that we think is absolutely essential around how we are, uh, how governments are, are making these equities decisions on when to stockpile vulnerabilities versus when to report them. And you, know, you mentioned WannaCry earlier, I think there are many lessons uh, sort of in, in, in an example such as, or an incident such as WannaCry, um, and there are others, for where uh, we would very much like to see a, a not only a, a clear policy that's being followed with a bias to report vulnerabilities to vendors, uh, but also more countries getting engaged in this discussion that uh, to some degree we've seen in the US, the US government has come out and, and sort of described its vulnerabilities equities process. We haven't seen anything similar really in Europe to date. and so. You know, for societies that are, that are digitizing as rapidly as, as they are, uh, and, and for societies that want to maximize the benefits from that digitization, I think you know, having some of these essential building blocks like a vulnerability uh, reporting process and an equities process in place, absolutely critical. Now, it turns out the EU is actually updating its cybersecurity strategy this year, and wouldn't it be a great idea to include some of these, uh, some of these approaches in, in, in some of these important strategies. So that's, those are some of the things that we've been, we've been advocating for. Very briefly, on the tech accord. 
As I mentioned, principles such as 0% offense, 100% defense, uh, absolutely, absolutely critical. But let's be clear, industry itself is not monolithic. There are companies out there whose sole business model and purpose it is to build cyber attack tools. And uh, also fairly clear that those are not necessarily the ones we're going to be able to convince. But when we talk about uh, sort of broad platform companies that have customers in, 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 in many, many markets around the world, I think from our perspective, these are things that we should hopefully all try to, try to be able to, to agree on. Another one is around assisting customers everywhere, sort of this, this idea of a global, globally neutral approach to things like patching. When we see two governments go to war on our platform or attacking each other on our platform, that's one customer attacking another customer, most probably. Uh, and, and so we are uh, keen on making sure that we are actually sort of equitable in, in, in how we deliver those, those patches and, and aren't withholding uh, those, those patches. I think the same is true for many other companies who aspire to be companies uh, in, in, in markets uh, around the world. Other efforts, and I'll, I'll just, I won't run through all of them, but I think, again, sort of coordinating and working together to fight the proliferation of vulnerabilities is one thing that needs, from our perspective, to be transcending competitive boundaries. We're doing that today with some of our biggest competitors, where we do share uh, certain information in the case of compromise and other things. Groups like ICASI are, 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 are really um, important in that, in that context. I saw, Jay, you mentioned that in your, in your study as well. Um, oftentimes little known, but, but uh, there are efforts that exist in niches that I think we need to lift up and actually make sure that from a, a sort of principal perspective, we get large companies to, to come and agree to this. And so we're working very actively on, on this. In particular, I think from our, from our perspective, it also seems on convincing governments, this is something that is not anything that will take a couple of months or even a couple of years. Uh, there are lots of, lots of uh, challenges in, in that context, and we can talk about those. But on this, we're trying to make progress more rapidly, and, and we're trying to, uh, trying to engage and, and are engaging with, with other companies on, on, on this notion of, of, of a need for a global tech accord. And then, finally, this question around attribution. I think Paul did a, did a, did a fantastic job this morning outlining some of the work that but some of the thinking that we've had on this, but also some of the work that our colleagues from the RAND Corporation uh, have, um, have uh, been, been pulling together. And, and again, just as a reminder, their report around uh, stateless attribution will be coming out, um, I believe, at the end of the week on, on Friday. But I want to be very clear on one thing, because we've been getting some feedback after, after this uh, concept was announced and Brad's speech from some folks that have said, well, attribution, that's inherently a government function. What are you talking about? And so from our, from our perspective, again, it's sort of really important to try and define what we mean and, and, and where, where all of us can kind of bring our, our, our respective, I think, strength to, to, to bear. There, there is, to date, a lot of technical data that resides in the private sector. If you have an email account with Outlook.com or Gmail or Yahoo, there may be times when you get notified from the vendor that you may have been the subject of a nation state attempt to, to, uh, to break into, to have your emails broken into. Um, now, those vendors will not tell you which nation state, but uh, it is a clear policy that most of the large email providers have adopted. We actually took our lead in doing so uh, from, uh, from Google on this. They were, they were sort of the first ones to, to, uh, to go down that route. And so it shows you uh, some of the technical capabilities uh, that do exist today. Uh, there is a lot of specialized knowledge. The challenge is that many of the research methodologies and how to go about this are, are tend to be more sort of uh, uh, individualized, maybe. Different, different security vendors have different approaches. There's a whole different litany of terminology around, around this. And, and there's also no real sort of agreed upon uh, set of confidence levels uh, that would actually be sort of a trigger point for when one would say, okay, at this stage we feel like we have enough scientific evidence to, to get, have a clear understanding of, of who's responsible. And so uh, not only does the RAND report, I think, or the RAND work in this has, do some, some, some really uh, incredible work, but uh, what we're hoping to achieve here is to actually, again, stimulate a much broader discussion on the fact that attribution has both a technical component 
that then might actually be able to further sort of enable a political discussion around attribution, which most certainly is uh, a, a government function. We are not saying Microsoft or industry should be in the business of political attribution or the discussion of consequences. That is a government uh, function. And so finally, I'll end on this, so, so we hopefully do have some time for questions. As uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we think about building out this organization, it's actually quite interesting. Again, I think Paul mentioned that uh, the idea here might actually be to have this led by the private sector, maybe by other researchers, to come together and, and form such a group, not necessarily with formal government participation. And so I think that's, that's just something uh, to, to make very clear that this is not trying to sort of rival government processes. At the same time, it, this, this group should have a, a narrow mandate. It should not, it should not have an enforcement uh, mechanism. And there's others that have suggested other things. I know, Jay, you've actually done some work on this as well. And, and uh, I think in your, in your proposal, you might have had, uh, you might have, <laughs> You, you might have, uh, I think, at the time called for some level of, of, of enforcement mechanism. And so there's different opinions there. Um, there is a lot to think about when it comes to uh, sort of confidence levels and, and thresholds, uh, which, again, uh, both the report and I think the, the, the discussion that's moving uh, forward on attribution, um, that, that's one of the critical uh, elements. And then, of course, it does, this organization does need to have a set of technical uh, credibility and neutrality and be sourced by, by technical experts from, from more than one country, from more than one geographic region, in order to have that sort of uh, ability to be, to be neutral. Uh, and then finally, there is an element about transparency. It, 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 it should be something uh, where the evidence is actually released to the public, so it doesn't happen in sort of a closed uh, 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 manner, which oftentimes today, when we look at at least the political attribution that takes place, We've, we've seen a lot more of that lately, but also I think it's true that we have, uh, that sometimes those, those, those uh, statements that are being made uh, then, then are not able to sort of be, be backed up by some of, the, some, of the, some of the technical details very clearly for protection of sources and methods, and from a government perspective that makes a lot of sense. But if you had an independent organization like that, I think there's a lot of merit in, in, uh, in, in actually driving that, that forward. So those are the three pieces. Uh, and that kind of makes up in some what, what Brad, at a, at a high level, kind of called this need for a digital Geneva Convention. I know that the term itself might give a, a bit of heartache to, to especially some of the international uh, humanitarian law experts, but I just wanted to walk through that and uh, very interested and uh, excited about uh, your, your comments and your feedback. So thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Jan. Um, so there's a lot of material to go on here because it is three reports about very different things. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to address regarding the, um, your call for global technologies to commit to not trafficking in cyber vulnerabilities for offensive purposes. Um, how realistic is this? Because governments and law enforcement agencies um, have legitimate needs for exploits and hacking tools. Um, and, you know, if we, look, if we look at what happened with the Apple FBI case, where the FBI was asking Apple to undermine the security um, of its entire uh, system in a way that would have opened um, Apple up to requests from other governments. And critics of that um, said there's got to be another way for the government to get into the system. And it turns out in the end that there was, indeed, a third party company sold an exploit to the FBI to get into this. So how do you balance that need uh, what you're saying about mm -hmm. companies should not be involved in the offensive business, um, how do you balance that with the real needs, the genuine needs of government? Right. So it's a great, great question. I, I think I, this is why I try to sort of caveat this in a, in a way to say industry is not monolithic, right? I think there are companies whose business model very much it is to develop tools to enable certain, 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 uh, certain things. And I agree. It's it's hard to imagine that those companies would sign up to a to a global tech accord that said we will we will not you know hack into systems. We will only do defense. Um, and it's at the same time also true that governments have uh, multiple uh, objectives and missions here. And there is a legitimate national security and law enforcement mission. And our approach has has not to date been 
to say governments should never develop a cyber weapon. That's A, not realistic, and, and, and I think B is also, uh, again, recognizing that governments have these different missions, uh, it, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be equitable. And so uh, I think the question is, how can we, for, for those companies that have uh, a large global market uh, 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 and, 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 and user, user base, how can we ensure uh, and enhance customer trust uh, by, by those mass market commercial off-the-shelf providers uh, that uh, customers are continuing to be, to be to, or willing to, to use those uh, in a way that, that, is, uh, that they're, they're trustworthy and that enables them to use them with, with confidence. And so I think this is where we kind of, that's the target audience, if you will. Uh, and now, of course, if we can grow this group to a, a global uh, set of providers that would sign up to these principles, I think that, that, that's all the, all the better. But ultimately, I think we need to be realistic. We need to start, I think, this is going to be sort of a crawl, walk, run. We need to start somewhere and then hopefully be able to convince others down, down, down the line. I, th I thought it was interesting. You, you mentioned the vulnerability equities process that the U.S. has and that hasn't really um, expanded to the U.S. Uh, or sorry, to Europe. And you've done a lot of work on the VEP process. And a lot of people would say it actually doesn't work or it doesn't work as we would have hoped it had worked. Um, I don't know, Jay, do you want to comment on? Okay, oh, the, um, yeah, so we did a report at Columbia. It was, it was uh, largely researched by the students as part of a part of project that came out last November on, on the VEP. And, and I came out actually pretty sanguine about it. I mean, I came out and saying, boy, it's actually, um, we need a balance. This is a balance, and there's some improvements that we can make. The work by Rob Kanaki and Ari Schwartz I thought was particularly good in, in looking at, at at the improvements, but it's really struck me in the time since that report's come out, to me the strongest criticism isn't that things like the SMB vulnerability were kept. Mm -hmm. To me the strongest, from, from my point of view, criticism has been from Dave Vitale and Matt Tate and others that say, look, there are so many vulnerabilities out there that having this big process that finds them and reports them one at a time essentially does gives you so little security that, it, that it's not even worth the effort because there's, so there's so many vulnerabilities out there. Um, to me, that's, that's led me to a, to a larger issue with VEP is that it's still a buy, one vulnerability at a time process. Do we, do we need to, de to define what the VEP process is? Does everyone know what it is? It, it's the process. It used to be in the old days, uh, the director of NSA could decide himself which vulnerabilities that he was going to keep. Um, for offensive attacks. For, yes. So, I'll retain, so he would retain some for NSA, and they would say, all right, well, these are others that we will disclose. It, in the same process, assumedly, would happen within um, the other agencies of the US government, but it was, NSA was, was the biggest. Uh, President Obama said, well, no, we're not gonna do it that way. It's gonna be the White House that's gonna decide this. You don't get to <laughs> decide for yourself. We're gonna do an interagency process. Now, it's still a one vulnerability at a time process. Um, meaning that even, and, and so I'm aware that even if we made the right decision every time on the vulnerabilities, you still might end up in a place where you've got this offense-defense balance uh, set incorrectly within the U.S. government. Um, yeah, that, I, yeah, I, I would just very briefly add to that. Yeah. I think, you know, not, not going to maybe go into detail on, on how well it's worked, but I mean, j just broadly speaking, having. A, an interagency process, or better yet, a whole of government sort of approach to mm. trying to weigh those equities, to us seems a whole lot better than having one particular uh, sort of actor with one particular sort of policy objective uh, t t taking this on. And I think, from again, from from what we're seeing in other countries around the world, uh, if if we can if we can create a bit of a groundswell and and and, and trying to encourage others to put a policy in place, that alone, I think, will, will, will help start us down a, down a path that actually is, is more productive. Mm. It's not going to solve the whole problem, completely agree. Right, and of course, Dave Attell's criticism is that, okay, the U.S. engages in this um, um, head-scratching process of determining whether or not they should disclose or not, but Russia isn't bothered by such a, you know, right. such a dialogue. Um, yeah. so, so are you putting yourself at a disadvantage if you do implement a policy like this? Yeah. And a lot, of my, a lot of my colleagues, especially the ones that are the mo most critical, say, well, why should we unilaterally disarm? Why should we give up these vulnerabilities if our, and, and there is a valid point to that, but if you pro is that a higher priority 
prioritizing that relationship of our, our capability, our zero day capability re with regards to our adversaries, more important than the relationship of the private sector relying on this software for innovation to be truer humans, <laughs> to be connecting as our, at our communities, if we only talk about that in the sense of unilateral disarmament, then we're prioritizing that over this other relationship, which is how we're using these technologies and Microsoft and, and, the, and these other software packages. So I want to switch for a second here to attribution, um, because it's such an important um, issue that is so uh, that's still so unresolved. Mm. Um, and you talked about, um, I mean, you did, you did sort of acknowledge the difficulty of uh, classified information, because attribution, technical attribution is very limited. Uh, forensic attribution is limited. And you do need that broader view that an intelligence agency or a government can bring in. But you were very adamant about this attribution um, organization entity would not be government uh, and would not be overseen by government. It would have to be independent. So how effective can an organization doing attribution be without that other view, that global view that an intelligence agency right. can provide, without the classified information that you're going to need? Right. Again. Great question. My answer is I think it, that would remain to be seen. The, 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 the key, and I completely agree, governments have other tools at their disposal. They have other means of collecting intelligence. Uh, and so this, this group would be limited to some of the, some of the technical and scientific, the scientific work uh, that, that it, would, uh, it would depend on in terms of the different sources of, of, of be it companies or other researchers wanting to contribute. Uh, and so from our, again, from our perspective, and there's different views on this, uh, as I said, sort of the, the, the RAND report seems to indicate that, that they believe for different reasons governments should not be part of that process. Mm -hmm. uh, among others, uh, I think they, they, they have a concern uh, that governments might try to sort of undermine both the input and also the, mm -hmm. the output of this organization uh, and, and uh, a couple of other things. But it, it's, it's uh, I think, something that, that as this organization gets stood up, there are different models uh, that we can look to. Um, for example, having a conversation earlier uh, with somebody talk about ICANN and how ICANN got started and governments really, initially at least, weren't, weren't, weren't part of this, this, this broader governance process, but then created the Government Accountability, um, uh, sorry, Ad Advisory Council, the GAC, and so had, had of course, input on, on, on some of those dis discussions. And I think there are different models for how, how, we can, how we can make something like this work. But fundamentally, I think the point is that if, if we can create a group that is able to bring more transparency based on a whole variety of sources, uh, then that in itself will lead to a process that might instill greater confidence in, in some of these uh, assessments. Uh, and it certainly would instill greater transparency, which in turn would hopefully uh, lead those that are thinking about conducting these, these sophisticated attacks to, to, to reevaluate and, and, uh, and, and maybe reduce some of the impunity that we're, that we're seeing today in that space. Jay, do you want to come and, and what I love is, like, first is attribution is one of those areas where we have gotten so much better, right? And it kind of fits in with our, with our comment, you know, with, with my talk, right? It had been a significant problem for years, and we have just, by patient application of technology operations and policy innovations, just been chipping and chipping it away, away at it. Um, my model, so I would been, I'd been talking about this model for this kind of organization for, um, for, for a couple of years, and my model was the Chonan investigation. So the Chonan was this South Korean Corvette, this Navy ship that blew up suddenly. What, what year was that, 2010, 2011? Um, and there was an international investigation tied to, the, tied to government that came in and they found the remains of a North Korean torpedo nearby and they went through all of this forensic evidence to show why they were confident in their assessment that this was sunk by a, Nor by, a, by a North Korean midget sub. And I thought that process of going through, of being clear about the, the, the technical evidence, to me was, was, was a very compelling kind of model. And so Microsoft isn't picking up this idea out of nothing. We have used this model before. The US government has pushed this model before to help try and make sure, uh, to try and help make the case in other places where something bad had happened and the authorship of it wasn't clear. 
I just have, a, oh, I'm going to have a quick follow-up question, but what happens, and then I'll come to your questions. What happens, though, when a government doesn't want to bring the attribution question to an organization like this? Um, you know, you do that if you want to do some kind of visible retaliation, mm -hmm. sanctions or something like this. What if you just don't want to even bother with that process and those organizations that technically agree to the attribution organization just decide to keep one attack for themselves and don't even go through that process? Right, but I think that raises the question of who, who are actually sort of the, the victims that this organization would be looking at and working with, right? And not, not entirely clear that th those need to be government, uh, governments who might have sustained uh, an attack or, or an impact from an attack. Um, it could actually start out with looking at attacks on something like a Sony uh, where, where you had a private organization uh, affected by, by an attack, right? And so then, they, but there's lots of questions. You're absolutely right about how, how, how would it work with victims? What if the victim then doesn't want to publicize the findings? And so I think what's absolutely critical is that this is a principle sort of principled approach where, where, where principles and clear sort of rules of engagement, if you will, get, get, get put in place uh, on both things like uh, the threshold question, the methodology for the research, the, the type of, of uh, experts that would be working on this, maybe a peer review process. Uh, there's, there's lots of elements there that I think need to, need to be worked out. But the thing is, today, we don't have anything like this. Mm -hmm. And I think our approach to this has been we have to start somewhere. And we're committed to, to making this a reality. We have two questions there. My name is Nikol I'm with the CCDOE. Um, my question goes to you, Jan. I'd like to know um, what Microsoft's timeline is. Like, you've been mm -hmm. talking about this for quite a while, but when are you actually going to like make a step forward and say we've rallied around uh, support long enough? Now we're going to actually implement this. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Thanks. Sure. Do you want to collect a couple, or do you want to just go one by uh, one? We can collect a couple if you want. We're running out of time. Let me go over here, and I'll come back to you, and then I'll go to you. Your question here? I don't have a microphone. Uh, can you hear me? Thanks. Um, Anriet Esterhuisen, um, Association for Progressive Communications and member of the Global Commission, Stability of Cyberspace. Um, thanks a lot. I mean, since this uh, um, has come out, it's, it's been a really interesting um, point of discussion. And, and I think, as Paul said this morning, civil society has really found this useful. But some questions. Firstly, how do you define peacetime in this context? To me, that evokes a very conventional warfare notion of what constitutes peace versus not peace. So, so, so I'd like to hear how you, how you see that. Then, um, secondly, do you see all three components happening at the same time? Are they linked? Or can they exist um, um, independently of one another or not be um, created sequentially? Um, and then on the agreement part, where do you see this agreement happening, this binding mm -hmm. agreement? Mm -hmm. And um, how does one keep an agreement like that broad enough to get consensus, but specific enough to actually have any value or any, any teeth and to be taken seriously. Um, and then on the <laughs> attribution idea, I think well, Kim has already asked some questions on that, but just to, to build on that, okay. can I ask one more? <laughs> well, we do have two more people we want okay, to get so, in. Okay, so um, just, okay, then I'll respond actually to the question you asked, Kim. I think it can work really well to have an alternative mechanism that um, traces attribution. I don't think it can conflict. I think it can provide transparency and perhaps some kind of counter source of information to other government um, or sources of, of attribution. So actually, I really like that idea. And I think of the three, um, that's the I think viable. that's the most um, valuable. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's quickly your question, and then I, I hope I'm not overwhelming you all with these. No, I'll try and take notes. Just one question. Yeah. A, um, uh, to you, Jan, on your last slide, you said that the uh, information uh, leading to attribution when should be made public. Um, since uh, we know, uh, assume that uh, very often this is based on intelligence by the states against other states. Um, it's not going to be made public. So how do you scale a circle? And then one final question here, and then... Oh, <laughs> oh. I can't see you. It's in the dark there. Um, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I think we just have to, unless we can go over, we have to. Go ahead. Thank you, I will be very brief. My name is Dimitri Vogelaar. I work for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Jan, excuse me if I bore you with this question, because we had this conversation already quite a few times, but 
how do you mitigate the risk that some actors might interpret in a new digital Geneva Convention mm -hmm. as a reason to state that the normal rules of the road do not apply? And that's something that we were also trying to do and work out in the talent manual, which I might have to admit I've also not read cover to cover. But that's it. OK, it's free for all answers now. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> Let me try to go through this. Um, also starting with actually the first question, the timeline. Uh, very good point. So as you may have followed, we have been talking about this need for cyber norms for, for a number of years. Um, I would say that Brad's speech actually was a, a bit of a bit of a sort of inflection point also for us internally. The, 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 the feedback that we received uh, after that speech, I think, um, sort of gave, gave, gave not only new impetus, but, but also I think sort of new urgency. Um, and, and, and I think there is, a, there is an understanding growing both inside the company, but, but I think increasingly also inside our industry, that talking about these things is not just a matter of good corporate social responsibility. You know, we'll, we'll gladly take that sort of feedback uh, if, if, if people s sort of mention that. But I actually think that this, is, this, is, this goes to part of our core business interests as well. Uh, you know, we are rapidly evolving to becoming one of the world's largest cloud uh, computing providers. And uh, when you are in a situation where you are uh, holding uh, many other people's data, I think you have to have a significant interest in a, in a more stable ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of innovation that we're doing, as we said earlier, on the technical side. But we are convinced that we also need to make progress, and we need to make progress fast on the, or faster on the, on the policy side. So uh, that would be my, 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 my sort of response to you. I can assure you that with the company leadership now having taken on uh, these, these issues, uh, in addition to the, much of the work that has underpinned it, uh, we, are, we are moving forward um, uh, on, on all, th trying to move forward on all three pieces. Um, the question of can they move forward in, in parallel, or are these dependent? I think we actually have less dependencies on the tech accord uh, side and also this attribution organization on, on governments. And so it seems to us those are the natural places to really, uh, in many ways, uh, focus our, 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 um, a lot of our attention. But that said, we are intent on moving all three pieces forward because we do think we need progress by, by and among governments. We need progress in the tech sector. And we also certainly need progress on the attribution piece. What else? Um, we have two minutes. OK. <laughs> uh, attribution question about intelligence being made public. I think that then comes down to who actually contributes the, 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 the information, right? the input question. Who, who contributes the, the, sort of the threat intelligence that goes in that becomes the basis for a finding? And again, our friends from RAND uh, seem to suggest, and, and, and I think there's a lot of, sort of merit to that, that at least in, in, initially, this, this would be something that would be done and contributed by uh, non-government <laughs> players, so other, other industry uh, uh, folks. And so I don't think we're actually, in, in that scenario, necessarily facing the same challenges. There might be some, but, but there might not be the same challenges as much when you, when you, when you sort of work with that group of, of actors. Uh, and then f the question, we had a question on um, binding agreement. How and, how and where could that be done? I think there are entire sessions at the conference on, on that question. And so I would just, and also ties to Dimitri's question, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, ultimately to us, and just to be very clear, we think that this is something that is sequential, that needs to be incremental. There are multiple building blocks to getting to something down the road that could have maybe more teeth or could be codified in a way. I think the work, again, I'll say it again, the work in the GGE, and the OSCE confidence building measures and many of these other existing discussions are absolutely critical and we want them to succeed and we want to see agreement even on voluntary sort of politically binding norms because we think that that is, that is a stepping stone to anything that could come beyond that. And, and the timeline on that, other than uh, maybe other than the other two pieces, the timeline on these agreements, we all need to be realistic about. This is something that, that will take five, 10, maybe, maybe 15, 20 years to, to, to agree. But if we don't get started now, I think this is exactly where um, this question of a tipping point actually comes, comes into place. And then very lastly, very briefly, so I think we've tried to clarify what we mean and what we don't mean with, with this term. I know there are some folks um, uh, among some groups of countries that, that have sort of had a bit of a heartburn when it comes to 
um, this term of, of a, or a convention or a, or a treaty. And again, that's not the starting point for us. That is sort of an aspirational uh, goal down the line. Uh, I think we've also tried to be very clear, and Brad has been very clear on this, uh, we are in no way trying to propose something that, that would restrict content or undermine existing protections for, for sort of universal human rights. Uh, and so, uh, of course, terminology is important. But I also would encourage those that have doubts or questions about whether something maybe more binding could be possible to not uh, shy away from, from that question as a whole. You know, to not, the, the, the EU, for example, just to name one group of actors, from um, everything we, we see and, and, and read, and, and, and in many ways very admirable, is a normative superpower. You know, let's not shy away from developing those norms and developing uh, uh, agreements that could actually have some, have, have some teeth, but let's make sure we get those right, and let's not cede that ground uh, to, to others who might want to use those processes of developing something legally binding for other means. So I, I, would, I would just sort of encourage everyone to, to have an open mind and try and, and uh, and, and, and get, the, get this accomplished. We're gonna go rogue. Go ahead, Jay. Okay, and, and just closing on the attribution intel and, and intelligence piece. You know, the one is I think the intelligence is most important where it, it can find a false positive, where other lines of evidence are leading you down to suspect one country is behind this and the intelligence doesn't confirm that, but it says, no, it wasn't them, it was this other country, a false flag. And, um, and to me, that is the most critical role for the, for the classified intelligence. Um, and I don't know how many times that's come up where the intelligence has come in and, 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 and identified a false positive. To, and I think we can work around the intelligence as an overall issue if you've got different people that are, ask questions in different ways. Technologists ask questions in one way, political scientists and public policy folks ask another way, journalists ask a third. I mean, imagine if on this team you had a Kim Zetter, Nella Nakashima, David saying, and the way that they ask questions and approach a problem, right? You can, I think, start working away the problem of classified intelligence in many of these cases. And I did want to pass my thanks to the commission members for being here, for the center, the volunteers, and sponsors. So thanks. Okay. All right. Let's thank the panelists for their wisdom um, on all of this. And did you have some? Yes,